Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a far off land, that's how fables are supposed to start, no? I hope you do remember those stories which you heard as children. If you have forgotten them, then that inner child in you is dead. But today, I've not come here to repeat those fables, but to remind you that those fables meant much, much more than what you thought they meant. Let's start with, once upon a time, long, long ago, in a far off land, there lived a king. And the king had a daughter, the princess. And she was the most beautiful girl in the whole world, not the second most. And then there was this prince. He was the most handsome man in the whole universe. And the prince and princess met and fell in love. And the prince went to the king and said, I want to marry your daughter. And the king said, you will have to go across the seven seas, braving the storms. And then there's a far off island. In that island, you'll have to climb up the mountain and there will be monsters and dragons and snakes. When you reach the top, there will be a parrot in a golden cage guarded by a witch, the most ugly witch in the whole world. And that witch can cast a spell on you and convert you into a toad. If you can overcome all that and get me the golden cage with the parrot, you can marry my daughter. And that's what he did. He braved all that and finally got the parrot in the golden cage. Don't ask me why the king wanted to exchange his daughter with the parrot, but for whatever reason. And then the prince and princess married and lived happily ever after. But nobody talks about the poor parrot. What happened to the parrot? What did he do that he has to be stuck in that golden cage without having the most beautiful parrotess or whatever you want to call it? <laughs> so somewhere we need to think a little deeper. Let's move on. Another fable which I'm sure all of you have even watched uh, on screen, The Jungle Book. There was this man cub called Mowgli and he grew up in the jungle. And there was this Baloo, the bear, who takes him under his wings and teaches him such a simple lesson, which is there in that beautiful song called Bear Necessities. He says, all you need in life is the bear necessities of life and you can thoroughly enjoy yourself. And Mowgli spent years and years learning about the bear necessities. He did not go to LKG, UKG, first standard, second standard. He did not learn maths and English and Kannada and all that. Do you really think Mowgli missed out on education? Do you really think what we need to teach children is what is taught in these fables or what is taught by Baloo the bear rather than what is taught in the classroom? Now incidentally what happened was when finally the man cub landed up in the man village the animals of the jungle got together and they said, why is man superior to us? Something is different? Yes, they said, man goes to school. Our children don't go to school. So we should create a school for our children, they said. So they went and peeped into the man school and they found that children were taught all the subjects. Every child had to pass in languages, in maths, in science, in social studies, then only they would be considered educated. Aha, that's what makes them superior, right? We'll have our own jungle school. So they said all animal children should report to the jungle school and every animal has to pass in walking and running, swimming, climbing trees, flying in the air, you have to have six subjects, no? <laughs> You're clapping for the school. I won't. Anyway, finally, you know what happened? All the animals failed in some subject or the other. And they decided, let the humans be superior to us. We are not interested in competing with uh, uh, them. Now, this world that we have inherited from the uh, 
animals, flora, fauna, whatever you want to uh, call it. What are we doing with it? We all grew up with all these fables, learning all these, you know, bedtime stories and all these things. But as we grew up, we thought, this is utter nonsense, forget it. Let me give you an example of a very famous story which all of you have heard. That of the hare and tortoise. You all heard of the hare and the tortoise. Okay. Now what happened was, there was this hare who came to the tortoise and said, let's have a running race. I'll show you that I'm faster than you. Tortoise said, shall we? Okay. And they started the race. And the tortoise was walking and the hare was running. So why don't I just sit and relax for some time and give this fellow a chance to come. And there he relaxed. And the tortoise continued slowly, 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 slowly walking. In the meanwhile, the hare went off to sleep. You know the story. And before you know it, the tortoise had walked and completed the race and had won the race and the poor tortoise was, and the hare was lost. Now the hare said, I made a big blunder. Because the proverb says, slow and steady wins the race. In today's 21st century, can you believe that slow and steady wins the race? Would all of you like to slow down and then win the race? No way, he said, nothing of that sort. So he came back to the tortoise and said, once more we'll do it. Tortoise said, okay, fine. Again the race started. And the tortoise started. And the hare ran and ran and ran and ran. And won the race and the tortoise was still here. So fast and focused wins the race, they say, in 21st century. The story doesn't end there. The tortoise this time called the hare and said, once more we'll have a race. But this time, I will decide the route. Hare said, any route, what difference does it make? Fine. These are the markers we have to follow. And there at the end, when you see the end, that is the winning point. Lovely, said the hare. We'll go. And they started off. And the hare, as expected, went faster and faster and faster. Till he realized that there's a river. And the end point is on the other side of the river. Now he's stuck. And the tortoise continued. Came to the river started swimming and went across and the hair was left. Work to your core competencies is the new moral of the story. <laughs> but it doesn't end there. By the time the hair and tortoise had become good friends, said, why are we competing with each other? Let's both make a team and run so that we become the fastest team. So they said, now we'll start running. But you know what they did now? The tortoise got on top of the hare. And the hare started running. Till where? Till they came to the river. And there, the hare got on top of the tortoise. And the tortoise swam through. And again the hare, the tortoise got on top of the hare and they ran. And there they were. Do any of your B schools teach you this? The hare and tortoise can teach you this. We have so much to learn. But somewhere along the line, we do not learn this. Let me take you to a very interesting uh, uh, story. There was a snake who used to go about biting people and its poison used to kill people. One day it happened to accost a very holy man, a sage. And the sage said, why do you want to cause violence? Why do you want to kill people? 
let's all live in harmony. The snake was very impressed with the holy man and said, yes, Guruji, tell me whatever you say. He said, stop biting people and spreading your poison and live in peace and harmony. Tathastu. Snake was very impressed and said, fine. He went away. Many, many days later, the snake came, thoroughly beaten up, bleeding, cut up in pieces. With great difficulty, he crawled to the great holy man. And this man said, what happened? He said, you know what happened? As long as I was biting people, they used to be scared of me. When I stopped biting people, they started hitting me. This is what you human beings are. The sage said, son, I asked you to stop biting. I didn't ask you to stop hissing. You turn around and hiss at that person, he'll run away. You don't necessarily have to bite him. Such wonderful stories, such wonderful, what do you say, morals of the story. One of the most famous is that Aesop's fables, Alice in Wonderland. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of sailing ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. What a wide range. Do any of our teachers teach us like that? No. If sailing ships are in the portion, then sealing wax is not in the portion. <laughs> Don't talk out of syllabus. But the syllabus of life is far, far beyond that. Just to give you a simple example, the other day, I was driving on a hot afternoon and there was this traffic jam. Anybody here who doesn't know what's a traffic jam, then I don't think you're from Bangalore. Traffic jam. And the vehicles are inching forward. And you know what happens in traffic jam? Everybody's agitated. People pulling out their phones and making some angry calls. People doing pam pam. People rolling down there this thing and saying, eh, move man and all that. It was going on, very natural. My car happened to be at a point where there was a construction going on. And they had put a huge, you know, pile of sand there. I don't know if any one of you have been childlike enough to go and dig into that sand on a hot summer afternoon. It's so cool inside. Because we have been to college and university, you know, so we don't know. There was this mongrel, a street dog. He never went to college or school. So he went on top of that heap, dug, 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 dug. Found it so nice and cool, he plonked himself there. And I was watching, every few seconds when somebody is doing pa po, he would open one eye and look at them and go back to sleep. <laughs> what are these people doing in life? And why can't you relax? What's so great about uh, this thing? These are the lessons that we need to learn. Okay, let me move on from animals to human beings. Even those human beings who never went to school and college, the human beings whom we consider as illiterates, I'd like to share with you, if you give me the opportunity, it happened in 1854. When the white man came to USA, the Red Indians, who were the original inhabitants, and who used to roam free all over the place, they were now started persecuted by the white man. And they started pushing them back. And one fine day, the president of the US, in a very, what do you say, generous gesture, wrote to the biggest of their chiefs, Chief Seattle, saying that, we will mark out a reservation for you. You bring all your cattle and your people and go and live there. We won't disturb you. The rest of the land belongs to us. Now, normally, a chief would have either responded in anger or would have got scared and run away. This illiterate, Chief Seattle, in 1854, replied to the president of USA, and I quote, how can you buy or sell the sky, the warmth of the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water, 
how can you buy them? Every part of this earth is sacred to my people. The perfume flowers are our sisters. The deer, the horse, the great eagle, they are our brothers. The rocky crest, the juices in the meadows, the body heat of the pony and man all belong to the same family. The great chief sends word he will reserve us a place so that we can live comfortably to ourselves. But it will not be easy. For this land is sacred to us. This shining water that moves in the streams and rivers is not just water but the blood of our ancestors. If we sell you land, you must remember that it is sacred. And you must teach your children that it is sacred. And each ghostly reflection in the clear water of the lakes tells of events and memories in the life of my people, including Saris. We do not understand when the buffaloes are all slaughtered. The wild horses are tamed, the secret corners of the forest heavy with the scent of many men, and the view of ripe hills blotted by talking wires. Where is the thicket? Gone. Where is the eagle? Gone. The end of living and the beginning of survival. 170 years have gone past, ladies and gentlemen. The end of life and the beginning of survival has started. I leave it up to the younger generation. We have messed up a lot. We have made a bad time of this world. But we have created you, the youth. And that is something that we are proud of. We know that you will do wonders. And you can take over the mantle from here and create a wonderful world. And I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much.